Hello, and thanks for tuning in to My Community, brought to you by the Library Television Network. I'm Fred Albert, the host, and I'm very pleased today to have as my guest Mr. Rick Cavender. Mr. Cavender was re-elected to his third term on the Kanawha County Board of Education in 2024, and he currently serves as board president. Rick is the executive director of Charleston Urban Works, formerly known as Charleston Main Streets a nonprofit organization focused on urban economic development, community development, business district marketing, and public space improvements. Since the program's inception, the districts have experienced public and private investments totaling over $420 million. He has a combined 23 years of nonprofit and business development experience in Kanawha County a 2000 graduate of Sissonville High School, and a 2005 graduate of West Virginia State University with a degree in Business Administration, Management, and Marketing. Rick currently serves as past chairman of the Board of Directors of the YMCA of Kanawha Valley. He is a 2015 graduate of Leadership West Virginia. He serves on the marketing committees for the Charleston Convention and Visitors Bureau and Festival Charleston as well as the Economic Development Committee of the Regional Intergovernmental Council. In 2018, Rick was among 30 urban development professionals selected worldwide for the Emerging Leaders Fellowship through the International Downtown Association. Rick resides in Charleston on the west side, and he is the parent of two boys, one in high school and one in middle school. Welcome, Rick, to my community. Thank you, Fred, for having me. Thank you so much. Those are lots of accolades oh, that uh, well. have been posted for you, uh, and I'm sure you are a busy, busy man. Yeah, so, so I have 25 years now, I guess I should have I racked up something, right? So, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure, but <laughs> your most current um, endeavor mm -hmm. as board president of yeah. the Kanawha County School Board, mm -hmm. still the largest uh, school board, school system in West Virginia, I believe. Yeah. I know that we have some competition with Berkeley County, right, right. but Kanawha is still the largest, yeah. from what I've read. How's that going? Well, you know, it's great. I well, it was just sworn in for my third term, I guess, uh, two weeks ago now, whenever that was, July the 1st. Um, and was uh, lucky enough and, and uh, to, to be elected president uh, by, by my peers on the board. So I'm, I'm excited about so it. So that's a true vote of confidence from the other board members. Yeah, that you yeah. Can I mean, that, that you can steer that ship. In yeah, the right very direction. thankful for that. And, and uh, luckily we have an incredible superintendent in Dr. Williams who, who leads the day-to-day -day operation. And to, to be you know, alongside him as president for the next couple of years, I'm, I'm very excited. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the school system mm -hmm. uh, in Kanawha County. Like other counties, I'm sure that uh, there are many challenges yeah. that maybe didn't exist eight years ago when you first came on the board. Mm -hmm. um, how how do you um, manage those challenges, and how are you going to approach the challenges? Well, you know, I, I use the term when I was first elected in 2016. As, as I know you recall, Fred, we had uh, the Elk River area had experienced the, the floods. Right. Literally, I think the month I was elected, and so I was sworn in that first week of July, and then we immediately started having these community meetings. So I use the term "baptized by fire." Right. Immediately had to get in there. Or by water. Or by water. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, right. it's amazing that. Um, uh, that's been eight years. Eight years ago, eight years. I know. Wow. And as you recall, the entire eight years, the last two terms I've served, we've been working to get Herbert Hoover High School rebuilt and now Clendon, Clendon Elementary um, rebuilt. Hoover, of course, opened last fall. So that was really experience for me to be able to, from start to finish, you know, work with all these wonderful folks in the Elk River area who had experienced such loss, including their school, which, as sure. you know, schools in many communities are the, the centerpiece of the community. The hub of the community. And yes. um, to be able to kind of work through that entire process and see it come to fruition and to see the most beautiful high school uh, has to be in the state of West Virginia, it, maybe it, even beyond. It's a phenomenal facility. Yeah, state of the really art. Is. And uh, to see that all happen uh, for me was, was uh, just really incredible. Incredible. And I know my fellow board members feel the same way. Um, but that certainly, I think, was a challenge at the beginning. Um, and, and there were challenges along the way. And then, as I know you remember, when in 2020, whenever COVID hit and the, the, the sh ship we had to steer uh, in that regard oh, to, yes. to ensure safety for our students and our faculty and our, our leadership, that was not an easy decision whatsoever. And it wasn't a unanimous decision as far as how we should, um, how we should proceed 
to keep our kids in schools, but keep them safe. Um, so uh, coming out of that, you know, coupled with uh, the events up the Elk River Way, the, the flooding in 2016, and then COVID hit, those are huge mountains to climb to, yeah. to try to, you know, make some sense out of uh, and, and to keep people safe. Do you see that we are in a better place now? I know, I know it's been a rough few years, mm -hmm. but with the schools now opening, like Herbert Hoover last year and Clendenin is on schedule mm -hmm. to open this fall, I believe. That's right. Clendenin Elementary. Uh, moving through COVID and we're in a much better place, but we still have, you know, from what I read and what I'm told, we still have children who feel a great sense of isolation. Mm -hmm. Their social and emotional being is somewhat damaged mm -hmm. or they're still recovering from that. So mm -hmm. do you think our school in, our schools in Kanawha County are handling all of those well? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the programming that they were able to put in place with the federal funding that we received during mm -hmm. COVID, which we're, I think we're now in the last year of that funding, right. um, was just, it, not only was it uh, essential, but it's it's turned out to be uh, something that, looking back, if we wouldn't have had it, I don't know if we could have continued the way we had. And that goes with our virtual program. Um, and, you know, that alone, honestly, uh, allowed for students to continue their education if they didn't feel safe at the time. Sure. Some of those students continued on with the virtual program. And then others, uh, m most of the others came back, uh, back in the in the in classroom setting. So I feel like um, you know th that's just one example. We've increased our mental health services, as you know, across the entire so county. Important. So, so important. So especially after what 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 we saw happen in 2020, um, you know, and you mentioned isolation, isolation, <clears throat> and certainly I've heard stories of kids, especially the ones who, like my son, he started middle school his first semester of sixth grade was the when we first shut down schools. Wow. So he he's just an example of someone who um, could have easily, uh, you know, fallen behind. Sure. If the proper, uh, you know, services weren't available both at home and in the system, um, you know, the entire semester just spent by himself learning online. We often think about those students who don't have that support system at home. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have many children in foster care or some children who are labeled <coughs> as homeless. Um, because of the circumstances that are beyond our control but and beyond their control for sure. Um, I, I really feel for them because they look to the school for sometimes just socialization. Mm -hmm. uh, school is more than just learning from the, the teacher. That's it right. is interacting with others. It is developing a, a well-rounded life in the arts and in uh, of course, literature and, and all of the things that make up a school, but the socialization is mm -hmm. so important. It teaches us how to interact throughout our whole lives. That's right. And if you don't have that, it, it can uh, be uh, hard to overcome. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, you know, um, we've lost some population statewide in mm -hmm. West Virginia. Uh, in Kanawha County. Kanawha County is not exempt from losing population. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we can turn that around somehow, some way down the road. Um, how is that affecting Kanawha County Schools? Well, as you know, I mean, uh, anytime you lose population, which we have consistently, I believe now for 10 years, wow. um, yeah, it, on average about four to 500 students a year. It's, it's, it's pretty substantial. Uh, and as you mentioned, that's a symptom of not just the county, but the entire state. Um, so in 10 years, that's 4,000 students. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. quite a bit. And so, you know, that's our, several the, schools. <laughs> sure. And the funding formula, of course, provides funding per student. So we lose funding every, every time a, um, a student either leaves the county, um, you know, goes into another means of education, whatever that, whatever their choice is. Um, and so we, tough decisions because of that alone sometimes have to be made, whether that's consolidation, um, you know, whether that's having to uh, move teacher positions from one school to another, or unfortunately sometimes cut positions. When we lose population for whatever reason, it, we, we have to make those tough, the, the superintendent makes the tough decisions, and of course we then as a board sometimes have to have to uh, reinforce or not Support reinforce his decisions. decision yeah. or her yeah. decision. So this year, was there a, a large number of 
what we call rifts or transfers or reduction. There were in staffing. Luckily, a lot of the positions where we, we they were able to just transfer to other schools based on seniority, as you know okay. that whole how that whole system works. There were unfortunately some cuts that, that had to be made. Um, you know, and and again, that's why I, as the as a member of the board of education and as somebody who works in our community every day. Uh, and, and does my best to champion the community, I, I can't stress enough how important it is um, to really invest in your public school, right? And to, and to remember how important it is, if you can, uh, if at all sure. possible, um, to, uh, to, to get behind your school and champion it because not only are they, the, as we mentioned, the hub of their, their communities, um, they provide so much more than just the education. And if we continue to lose students, for whatever reason it may be, um, that's going to, that those decisions are going to become harder and harder. It, you know, uh, it amazes me that people who um, fuss and, and criticize our schools maybe haven't even entered a school in many, many years. Mm -hmm. They're so different now than five, ten years ago mm -hmm. uh, just because the challenges are different for everyone. But one of the challenges is, and we are facing this in West Virginia, we're facing it in Kanawha County, we're facing it nationwide, is a teacher and service personnel shortage. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that crunch in Kanawha County? Is it hard to get math teachers? Is it hard to get uh, special educators uh, to fill the classrooms? There are certain areas, special education being one of them, that we've, we've seen like it live in real time where it has become more difficult to, to fill those classrooms. Um, we do have people that are, are lined up to a degree to, to take certain positions in the school system, but we have seen, I think this is a nationwide issue. It is. You would know that better than I would, I think, but um, folks are just not wanting to enter education, period, right now. Um, and, and I say that broadly, That's I don't want to make that a broad statement. There are tons of wonderful, wonderfully educated folks who it's their passion and their love and, and you know, God bless right. them. Um, um, but uh, we have seen sort of an uptick in folks saying like, you know, I just don't, I'm not sure I want to do that. And so we have seen some of those effects. Well, I think even colleges are, and universities are saying we're not getting students in education preparation, you know, to become teachers like we once did. Mm -hmm. um, do you see anything that, or are you aware of anything that Kanawha County could do to incentivize, to attract uh, younger people? Because I remember many years ago we were, we were talking about how our teacher population and our service personnel, cooks, custodians, school secretaries, bus drivers, mm -hmm. how that group are all aging mm -hmm. and at some point they're going to be retiring mm -hmm. and moving on. Um, that's been happening really for many years, but I think we're at a crucial point now where we need to attract young people into the professions mm -hmm. and do you see any or do you have any ideas about how to incentivize? Uh, you know, you've seen those uh, those statewide programs and local programs. Like that, grow your own and, and yeah, well, and even the like the economic department. development organizations are doing to get people to move, especially right. during COVID, right? When, with the remote work era now, getting people to move back here for several reasons. Cost of living is very reasonable here. Um, wages are not terrible, especially if you're, you know, have a, any type of professional education, whether that's trade education or college education, um, you can make a, you can make a good life here. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are a lot of organizations that were doing, I think, a really good job of selling that to other, to folks outside of the state, and they were able to bring people in. Um, it'd be great to see that uh, that same approach made at the, on the education level. There have been some in incentive programs, I think, that we did in Kanawha County a couple years back, um, like sign-on type things, if I remember, uh, to get them to come here and to, and to be teachers. I'd like to see more of that. Um, you know, I guess we'll, we'll see what the budget looks like if we have the money to be able to, to really, you know, dangle a carrot and incentivize folks to, to come here. And, you know, I, I obviously believe Kanawha County is the best county to work in. It's, you right. know, not just I because I'm on the board, but, um, you know, just, just seeing how happy uh, so many people are who, who work uh, in this county for, for whatever school they're at. And I think that there's a lot, uh, a lot of opportunity there. There are many great resources in Kanawha County provided, you know, for our teachers and students. and. Um, it is, in my opinion, one of the best, uh, if not the best in the state. I, I always argue that with other friends from around the 
around the state, but I think Kanawha County is and does a great job of, of educating our students. If you've ever attended anything like um, the Arts Alive with the West Virginia Department of Education in the springtime, they have an evening of uh, showcasing uh, our students in the arts. And it's just, it's, it's worth your evening to go and, and witness something like that. And mm -hmm. to know that these young people have learned their crafts or their talents have been expanded through our educators mm -hmm. and through our system. L um, let's, before we leave education and talk about some of the other hats that you wear, uh, you know, we have things now like the Hope Scholarship, um, school choice I know is, is a big item right now, uh, homeschooling, virtual schools, I'm not criticizing any of those things. Those are choices, but to me, we've always had those choices. Mm -hmm. We've always had the choice to homeschool our children or to put them in a private school. But do you see um, that as a, a real concern going forward, that it is eroding more of what's happening in our school systems? It's, I know it's taking away some funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that that's where I have the concern. I 100% believe that every parent should be able to, to make the choice as to how their child is educated. Sure. That, is, that is not the business of me as an elected um, official to say, you should do this with your child. I would never no. ever say that. Um, I do have issue with public funds uh, being diverted to incentivize folks to do that. Right. You've always had, you're right, you've always had the choice to homeschool your kid. You've always had your choice to send them to private school. Um, and, and I'm glad we have those choices here in America, sure. right? Um, but when it comes to public funds um, that are so crucial to make sure that our buildings are kept up, that our educational programming is top notch, that our teachers are paid, um, you know, and I, I'm a firm believer that they're nowhere near paid the amount they should be paid. Right. Um, you know, funding that is so necessary to, to successfully run uh, a county school system, when, when those funds are being diverted to, uh, to, to give parents who want to send their kid to a private school or want to send their kid to, uh, or to homeschool them or whatever the case may be, um, you know, that does um, slowly but surely, it can erode um, a, a school system and, and make it challenging for us to fund what we promised the public we would fund. Sure, you know? absolutely. Well, you know, we want the best for everyone, and like you said, it is a choice, and, and no one is knocking people no, to of have the not. choice that they, they feel is best for them. Let's talk about some of the other things that you do. Yeah. Uh, what is the, and now I'm going to, I want to call it Main Street, but it's yeah. Urban... Urban Works, Charleston Urban Works. works. Yeah, yeah. Urban Works. That's yeah, we just rebranded about eight months ago. Okay, um, so it takes me a while to get used no, to I get it, new I get brands. It. You know, I, I, I still call um, Walgreens Rite Aid. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right, sure. Yeah, no, um, uh, I've been lucky enough to be the executive director of what is now Charles Charleston Urban Works, formerly Charleston Main Streets, and before that, years ago, it was East End Main Street. We, okay. were, we were just in one part of the city. Um, but we, um, we are an organization that focuses solely on urban economic community development, so it's, it's business development. Um, it's, uh, it is not, um, uh, you know, residential focus whatsoever. Uh, we, we focus on um, giving business owners, small business owners, property owners opportunities to, uh, to invest in their properties, to enhance their business, uh, to give them more opportunities to get the cash registers ringing. Um, Etc. So, can you give um, me an example of where that has happened? Sure. Yeah, we have four area, four main areas of focus. So I'll okay. just give you a couple examples of a couple of those areas. Number one is is, is business marketing and promotion. So, um, <clears throat> right now we just made the announcement last week that we we launched our new passport card program. So we have a partnership with Element Federal Credit Union. Um, you can now sign up for a debit card through them. Okay. Um, it's, it's the Charleston Urban Works Passport Card, and uh, if you sign up for an account with them and you open up a, an account with them, link link that debit card to it, you can visit any of our district businesses. And we've actually partnered with the downtown association as well. So the downtown businesses, so East End, West Side, downtown, anytime you go and swipe that card, any of those businesses, you immediately get 2% cash back. Oh, really? So we're, yeah, so that's, so, and then we have other incentives that are involved with that. It's all on our website, charlestonurbanworks.org. Um, and, um, you know, it's just a really good way to hopefully help people remember to, to think locally before they decide to go up to a box store to get their screwdriver sure. they need or whatever, sure. uh, or if they're wanting to eat out. So are all, do you then have a certain group of local businesses that are involved in that? Do you have to have some type of agreement with them or no. if I want to go to a hardware store on the west side of mm -hmm. Charleston and use that card, does that automatically 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Work. We don't we don't require our businesses pay okay. or anything to be involved in, in programming like this. Um, we our, we believe our role and the, one of the reasons we exist is to help uh, to help them, right? Okay. And so um, we're lucky enough to have a really good diverse stream of funding. We are a nonprofit organization, so of course we uh, the city of Charleston is one of our strongest partners financially and programmatically. Uh, mm -hmm. They're absolutely wonderful. City Council, the uh, Mayor Goodwin's administration, they're all incredible, and they've been wonderful partners for years. Um, the Urban Renewal Authority, the, the Charleston CVB. Um, you know, we have some national affiliates as well, and we have countless corporate sponsors that provide uh, funding for our organization to help us do our work. So that's one area. So the Shop Local program just launched. Okay. Um, we also host events every year. We have two main events we hold every year, one on the west side, one on the east end, Foam at the Dome on the east end, October West on the west side. Those are fundraising events for our organization that helps us, uh, you know, fund our programming to execute our programming through uh, through staff. And um, Those have really grown. They're huge, yeah. We have a typically, on average, about 20 2,200 people, depending on the year, that come to that event, uh, to both of those events every year. Uh, but they also showcase the business districts. They get people that m might not have ever thought to come to the West Side or East End to shop or eat, to get right into the heart of the uh, urban core of the city um, and enjoy uh, just a really incredible evening. And then they go out hopefully right after and they eat at a local restaurant. And then they right. remember that next time and they come back. So there are several reasons we put those events on. But um, that's just another example of our work. And uh, I would say one of our biggest projects we're working on right now as a public space enhancement project on the west side. We announced it a couple years ago. It's our gateway lighting initiative. We are completely um, uh, reconfiguring and replacing all of the lampposts in the Elk City District of the west side. Uh, so where is the Elk City District exactly? Does it start at the Elk River? Yeah, go so west as far as the business district goes, it starts at Pennsylvania Avenue and goes down to the railroad tracks, and then it cr kind of creates a square over to Lee Street. Okay, that's our that was what we what we consider our Elk City business district. So that's sort of the gateway into the West Side. So right. that mural that you see with the guy sitting on the bench, yes. the Dreamer mural, we commissioned that mural a oh, couple okay. years back. So <clears throat> a few years back now, but uh, public art is another thing that we do. But anyway. Um, that project that's going to, it's a safety enhancement project, an aesthetic enhancement project. So you'll be, you'll see, um, you know, bright, shiny LED lights on the, on the sidewalks and the street, but also they'll be shining up onto the buildings as well. So it's one of, it's a first of its kind project um, in the region, possibly the state. Uh, we, we look to have that completed uh, here in the next few months. We've gotten a really diverse stream of funding for that, federal funding through ARC, uh, the McGee Foundation, uh, Greater Canal Valley Foundation, AEP Foundation, uh, the city of Charleston all helped. Um, for our fundraising efforts to, to get that project launched. So it's take, taking more time than we'd hoped with COVID and then of yeah. course with you know our funding and um, whatnot, but but we're, we're getting ready to start the construction phase and I'm really excited about it. Can you tell me, do you know what's happening uh, and is, I don't know if this is part of the urban works uh, development, but uh, the old um, Fountain Hobby Center, do you know what's <laughs> happening there? I know it's under reconstruction or remodeling or something's going on there. yeah there were a couple of public articles uh, made about that after it was purchased um, by the same owner of the building at uh, where uh, uh, but they're restoring the building correct that's the that's the plan okay. yeah and that that's a big project um, you know when you take when you, this is a prime example of a historic property um, right. that uh, is absolutely worth saving and needs to be saved and sure. needs to stay there uh, and has the 100 percent capacity and capability to be restored and be uh, completely historically renovated um, you know, the good news is the owner of that building now has put a new roof on it. He's uh, gutted, gutted the entire upstairs, got it fully ready to, to for uh, for redevelopment. And so as far as what the plans are, I think some of that's still up in the air. Okay. But, um, you know, the good news is it has started. And it, I'm so glad they were able to, to, to acquire that building and get that work started. It's always, you know, it's so much nicer to see a building restored as opposed to being demolished. And I know that some need to be demolished, mm -hmm. but I, I still grieve over the fact that we tore down the uh, old arcade in Charleston. Yeah, 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 I don't yeah. know if you're, you're maybe well, not old enough to, well, I, to I've, remember I've that, but I experienced seven, it. Yeah, and yeah. It was a unique place, uh, and I just like, why did we have to tear that yeah. down? But, well, the good news I, is I there are, I'm oh, sorry, uh, but okay. the good news is that, the, to your point, there are grants available, there are tax credits available. Um, you know, we worked as an organization with a statewide coalition to get the state uh, historic tax credit increased from 10% to 25% a few years back, I believe right. in 2018. Um, so, you know, if you're a property owner and you are looking to historically renovate a property, um, you have access between federal and state of 45% of your investment to, that you can actually uh, make back over the course of five years. 
um, whenever you decide to historically re restore a property. So there are incentives out there for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the, the culture or the uh, Division of Culture and History offers grants to help with some of this as well. So right. a lot of opportunities if you really take the time. It is more time consuming and, and more work involved. I'm but sure. in the in the in the the grand scheme, it's definitely worth it. There there are several businesses on in that Elk City district mm -hmm. uh, that you know if you haven't if people haven't visited, they really need to mm -hmm. make their way over there. I know we have a new restaurant that just opened yeah, up, Sergio's. Uh, Sergio's. Yeah. Uh, I've been there once. It's delicious, mm -hmm. very, very friendly atmosphere. I, I wish them much success, yeah. and I think they're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, the Dancing Dog ice cream yeah. place, they yeah, seem to be a do, do a nice business. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting to see those businesses that are actually appear to be thriving. Yeah. yeah, and it's not just, the good news is it's not just um, the food industry and, no. and, and the bar industry. It's also, um, you know, we're seeing retail do pretty well as well. Good. Uh, and so, um, you know, what we're hoping to see is, is more of that. And speaking of property owners, you know, the Elk City District <clears throat> is a prime example of, you know, pe uh, people who have decided to invest historically uh, in properties and do the work um, to restore these buildings to their, their former glory, if you will. Uh, and what that does is it attracts people to want to be in those areas and start their business there. We've seen that happen several times now. So um, there's still some work to do on the east end in that regard. We've unfortunately lost some lost some buildings on the east end that we're we're trying to like kind of take a take a step away and strategize and figure out what the next best steps are for um, that that particular district. Um, but the good news is that we have a really good blueprint with what's happened in Elk City and not just Elk City, but also other parts of the West Side. Five Corners is doing some really good stuff over there. They have some good thriving businesses in that particular micro district. Uh, and even the far west side, I mean, we've seen Young's department store has been there for you know decades, right. um, and Smokehouse, you know these these very historic Charleston businesses that continue to do well that are on that more far end there. Uh, we have new housing that's going up right now down there. So there's there's exciting things on the on the horizon. I think in in general with any urban district in Charleston, and I'm just really happy to be a part of it. Well, and as those things develop and it brings in more business, that's going to bring in more hopefully attract more people. That would help our school system have more students. You know, all of it works hand in hand. That's right. So you can't um, you can't overemphasize the the importance of doing all of that to bring about more uh, community growth. And that's right. And that's that's what's so important to all of us. Mm -hmm. What do you do in your spare time? <laughs> uh, that's you a good question. Raise two sons. Uh, we have, have two sons. One is at Capitol High. He'll be in tenth grade, and one is in at Horseman Middle. He'll be in seventh. Goodness. And they stay very busy with their extracurriculars. I have one that's getting ready to start driving soon. So that should be interesting. Oh, that, that'll uh, take good. And you know, hopefully, getting a job soon. But um, but no, though they're 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 doing really well. We we got moved into our new house about a year ago, and I've been kind of busy, you know, getting that fully established, and um, that's kept me pretty busy. Try to stay active physically, you know, uh, still you know try to uh, take a run on the boulevard, go to the gym. Um, spend time with friends, spend time with family, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, travel. I've been traveling good. more, which is great. Um, so you. trying to get a good balance of, you know, work, work and life. You well, know. you're a very busy man, and we do appreciate you being here on my community. Uh, just very briefly, you were a graduate of Leadership West Virginia. Do yeah, you have any words to say about Leadership West Virginia? <clears throat> it was the it was the, one of the most impactful experiences of my life. As you know, it's a program that lasts, uh, I think it was eight months total. It yeah. starts, at, ours started in March, went through November. We, we visited, um, I think, seven different regions, different cities in the state and spent two to three days in each region. Um, you know, I went, I was in Mayor Goodwin. Mayor Goodwin and I were in the same class. That's exactly. how we met. And, you know, General Hoyer and all these wonderful people that I went through that program with, highly recommended. So. Good. Rick, thank you so much for being our guest on My Community. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you will join us the next time.